All right, we are recording. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, A Body of Evidence, Measures to Improve Collection and Reduce Contamination. My name is William Moore with OJJDP's INTAC, and before we begin, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping slides for everyone to keep in mind for today's web event. Um, this, uh, Webinar is brought to you by our colleagues with the Zero Abuse Project. Please note that it is being recorded and will be published on Intact YouTube page. Please note that you can go to Intact's YouTube page and you can view uh, archived webinars that we have related to juvenile justice. Um, for any transcript or supporting materials, please be sure to contact the OJJDP TTA help desk at OJJDP TTA at USDOJ.gov. If you're having any trouble uploading any materials, please note that you're able to reach out to the OJJDP TTA at USDOJ.gov in order to access any of the materials. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can always send a private message to the web event host. Please note that at the end of the webinar, uh, we did take questions. Please note you can also submit your questions towards the end of the webinar to our presenter as well. All right. Uh, so we will do a quick count for everyone. If you're viewing today the group as a group, please go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people that are joining you today. If you're viewing alone, there's no need to type anything at this time. Please note that individuals who attended will receive a certificate about 24 hours after the conclusion of today's web event. If you would like to receive a certificate for those who attended in a group, you can reach out to OJJDTTA at USDOJ.gov and we can get a certificate to those who attended the training. That being said, I'd like to turn over today's presentation to our presenter, Mr. Tyler Council, for today's web event. Tyler, take it away. Thank you so much, William. So my name is Tyler Council, and I am the Director of Child Advocacy Studies, or CAST, an academic program that's designed to better prepare college learners for recognizing and responding to child maltreatment when it manifests during their professional careers, be that as a teacher, a physician, law enforcement, or lawyer, or in any other child-serving employment path. I'm actually also a forensic scientist with nearly a decade of experience in the laboratory. Since forensics, and as it pertains to today's topic then, evidence handling is so vital to the ultimate success of your child maltreatment investigations and subsequent prosecutions, I wanted to share best practices and evidence handling, and then this second presentation in a three-part series. So our agenda today is marked as follows, and we'll go ahead and we'll start looking then at the presentation. This presentation is provided today through Zero Abuse Project's Trauma-Informed Prosecutor Project, which is supported through funding from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, an office of the U.S. Department of Justice, and a component of the Office of Justice Programs. Let's go ahead and look at our agenda then. Today we'll focus on how we can improve our crime scene investigations, optimize evidence handling, maintain awareness of contamination, and ultimately improve our chain of custody. Because we'll be dialoguing about evidence and crime scene processing, I just wanna warn you all that you might see or hear about evidence in cases that might be traumatizing to some viewers. As such, practice self-care accordingly. Let's go ahead and get started then. You know, a recent article by Robert Sanger in the Journal of Legal Profession argues that prosecutors need to understand all facets of forensic science, including the collection, processing, and chain of custody of the evidence being analyzed by a lab. So what could go wrong if you're untrained on this subject? Well, if you don't know anything about evidence handling or review of chain of custody documents, you may wind up trying to admit evidence that was ultimately compromised at some point. After all, collection, storage, and handling can impact admissibility and even the results gleaned from a piece of evidence. You may also bring your CSI or crime scene investigator to the stand to testify on their handling procedures to only learn in that moment that their processing of the evidence was inadequate, leading to serious issues that, like a scalpel in the hands of a skilled surgeon, allow the defense to dismantle your case. In fact, this very issue is perceived to be a moderate or tier two issue in a recent publication by Daniel Lawrence and Associates in an article published by the Rand Corporation, a nonprofit dedicated to policy and decision-making improvement. 
Through their Priority Criminal Justice Needs Initiative, they surveyed prosecutors and found that these professionals consistently struggle with staying up to date on tracking and identifying when an investigator or lab analyst may have made a mistake before they come to court, which could have major consequences on case outcomes. As a tier one priority in the article, the authors claim the amount of data that prosecutors need to examine to do their job has been growing exponentially over time. While the level of individual responsibility for missing potential evidence and important information is also growing in leaps and bounds. In short, your responsibility to ensure evidence is handled and stored accordingly is increasing. So you need training such as this today to avoid being overwhelmed and creating a circumstance where your knowledge base becomes antiquated. After all, Failure to keep up on these key aspects that are quickly becoming a part of your profession will no doubt put the children you are trying to protect in harm's way as cases result in less than stellar outcomes. Let's go ahead and look then at why investigators naturally need this type of training. Investigators and those involved in, for example, CSI work especially have to stay on top of the rapidly changing methods and science behind evidence handling. Labs and their sensitivities with their methods change at arguably a breakneck pace. And how you need to collect evidence may one day quickly change too, as your methods introduce contaminants or DNA mixtures that could otherwise hamper sample use in a court of law. You need to then stay up to date on these principles so you stay, your chain of custody stays true. Your crime scene isn't overran with excess personnel or exposed to contaminants, and so that you collect the best evidence for the case in such a way that the lab can give you optimal results. In fact, a 2011 study assessed the top qualities of crime scene investigators and found that knowledge is the number one attribute to top performing CSIs. It makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you're not educated regularly on changes to the field, you're not savvy to the most current practices in literature. So you're bound to leave a crime scene with key evidence left behind, destroyed or sullied by contaminating elements. You know, there are several reasons even for forensic interviewers to know about evidence handling. The American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children and the New York Foundling have published guidelines for forensic interviewers and specifically note that notification to parents and guardians could jeopardize evidence if not coordinated with other investigative agencies beforehand. Imagine if you have to, right, imagine you having a disclosure for a bloody pair of underwear, for instance, and notifying the parents post-interview, only for them to then end up destroying the evidence because it could be used against, say, the grandfather living at the home who winds up being a key suspect. Siloing in between agencies then can be devastating for the children we are trying to help and for the evidence and quality of our cases as such. Now I've mentioned this in other presentations, but some children's advocacy centers present evidence in forensic interviews. And the National Children's Alliance did write a position paper on the controversial subject. If you're one of the CACs or children's advocacy centers that practices this methodology, you need to know how to handle items without jeopardizing their quality, and you need to know tips on good chain of custody to then prevent the evidence from being rendered unusable downstream. Forensic interviewers need to know a thing or two about actual evidence collection considerations, too. Per the Child Welfare Information Gateway's Forensic Interviewing, a primer for child welfare professionals fact sheet. Forensic interviewers are responsible for helping the other investigative multidisciplinary team or MDT members to recognize locations and items that may be of evidentiary importance. You, as the one interviewing the child, could then help investigators key in on potential contaminants or elements that might otherwise jeopardize the quality of the evidence if the investigators go in to collect blindly without any ideas as to the full context of the evidence. As a hypothetical, you know, a needle could be hidden in undergarments used in the commission of a drug-induced sex crime. You know this information, and you share it with law enforcement. They, in turn, then, could collect the item safely and potentially avoid personal injury. Now, what if this item, furthermore, is out in a wooded area, and you just happen to watch the forecast and found out that it's going to rain in two hours? You, as the forensic interviewer, could help investigators then try to mobilize and collect the item before the environment itself compromises it. Overall, we need to just look at why proper evidence handling and training thereof is so necessary. The writer and philosopher George Santayana said that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I think we are, as investigators, perhaps stuck in a cycle of failed history lessons. Starting back in 1995, most prominently and likely before that, though these are the most important and pertinent cases then that are worth a mention. 
So the O.J. Simpson case was arguably the first case to really shed light on chronic issues in crime scene investigation. Investigators placed blood evidence swatches inside of plastic as opposed to paper containers where the DNA could degrade or bacteria could overtake the items. They collected some blood evidence weeks after the crimes had been committed. They walked around for hours, for instance, with a blood vial instead of delivering that immediately to the lab for chain of custody preservation and just for natural packaging and stored storing and, and for preservation of that item pre-analysis. In the lab, analysts also ran afoul of issues with evidence handling as they spilled Mr. Simpson's blood in the laboratory and then shortly thereafter processed samples. Given the global exposure this case received, you'd think investigators would have learned how to properly collect evidence and establish a chain of custody. But these issues nonetheless persist. For example, not even three years later in Massachusetts, police charged a man with three homicides, but he was repeatedly exonerated due to evidence-related issues. In one of the cases, detectives lost an entire investigative file. In another, they failed to collect physical evidence at a crime scene. The third case was entirely based off of eyewitness testimony with no other reliable sources of direct or corroborating evidence. Fast forward to 2012, an internal investigation by Arizona police revealed that an officer knowingly botched 10 cases by taking evidence home and keeping it in his garage and by failing to write reports or even a mixture of both. Included was a report in a murder case that the detective put off for five years. Again in 2012, three months after a child disclosed sexual abuse by his uncle in Missouri, investigators had yet to test the sexual assault kit in the shorts with alleged bodily fluids on them. You know, whether it's local, state, or federal, or even our own armed forces, we continue to encounter evidence collection issues. The U.S. Army in particular, in a report from the Department of Defense Inspector General's office dating back to 2017, found that 6% of child sex abuse cases audited and that were closed in 2012 failed to conduct sexual assault forensic examinations. Even more concerning, they didn't collect key evidence from the crime scene. More recently in Texas, three months after a raid, evidence was left to sit in a home, including body fluid stains, clothing with evidence on it and bullets were still left in the walls of the property, unprocessed. A Utah officer was fired after it was found that he broke the chain of custody on evidence and was showing victim images to other officers and making lewd comments about the victim. As you can see, time and time again, year in and year out, we hear these stories. Our own organizations or those we work with wind up making the same mistakes time and time again and the problems resulting from these chronic failures to learn from the error of our ways. And this inability to evolve has serious consequences. What are some of the consequences then of not learning about evidence handling procedures? Well, these cases with evidence handling mishaps do damage to children, for example. They're forced then to continually suffer abuse because we don't actively collect and move to process evidence from a case. Further trial and error at getting evidence collection and chain of custody right comes at the cost of a child or other victim acting as an instrument of learning, which is never acceptable. We should be taught how to handle evidence and what to process before we enter the field and continually through our career. You know, a victim could be required to resubmit to evidence collection or have their property searched again if things are not done right the first time, leading to increased stress on their end. If we don't know how to collect something properly, we wind up having items that can't be analyzed in the lab or that don't get entered into court, and it hurts the overall prosecution and case resolution. Agency and key stakeholders therein wind up looking then less than professional, and the reputation of the organization or individuals therein are tarnished. In terms of cost, the trauma and perception-related stress could cause overturn of good employees, too, that leave the field forever. I have actually taught in 2020 investigators in my forensic science class for the university where I instruct, where they have people collecting evidence with no policy manuals, no physical evidence bulletins, and as shocking as this may seem, no chain of custody. Because of these major and persistent issues and evidence collection and chain of custody challenges, we wanted to provide a presentation that succinctly serves as a jumping off point for agencies that are looking to improve their evidence handling procedures, or for those folks who just want to refresh their knowledge if they already have measures in place. These considerations here and today then will be focused mostly on biological evidence and evidence related to child maltreatment casework, given the context of the work that we do at Zero Abuse Project, alongside then my own expertise having been a forensic scientist in a biology unit.
So the illustration here just shows a typical evidentiary lifespan. An event occurs and we need to verify what, if any, crime occurred. Evidence may be deposited and then you, the investigative MDT, have to collect it. Typically, gatekeepers of the evidence then are our first responders, CSIs, medical examiners, and emergency service providers, such as fire or EMTs. From there, the life cycle transforms from a linear progression to a cyclical series of events with three key points where chain of custody maintenance is of vital importance from a storage and maintenance stance. Some evidence doesn't need lab processing and analysis, so it can go straight to court, while other items need forensic interpretation to shed light on the meaning behind it and to help establish connections between the victim, the scene, the suspect, or some combination of the three in some capacity. Law enforcement and labs have evidence clerks to procure and secure the evidence, maintaining the chain of custody. Lab clerks will even help investigators determine what they may or may not accept as evidence to process at the lab. Regardless of lab intervention, evidence nonetheless will arrive in court at some point and in fact may be maintained then by the court clerk or the prosecutor. Thus, at each one of these points, we have key stop gaps where a chain of custody is important to maintain as to who accessed the evidence, when, and why. We also have key checkpoints where evidence could be potentially contaminated, destroyed, or otherwise rendered useless for our investigation. So let's go ahead and start at the very beginning where we look at the first discovery of the crime in a address then basic crime scene procurement and processing tips to avoid evidence related issues. Now I want to preface the next few slides with a disclaimer. What steps or tips or information that I'm going to teach you about today is just an example of best practices. Every agency or lab may well have their own policies and procedures. As such, feel free to use this information to consider revising policies, creating new policies, or even just simply as a refresher as I mentioned earlier, if it's been a while since you explored best practices and evidence collection. I'm going to, by and large, skip over the initial response, safety assessment, and emergency care protocol steps since those are phases to scene management that are focused more on locking down the scene and ensuring optimal safety from a threat assessment and life-saving stance. You know, the only evidence-savvy tips I have during the initial assessment and examination of a scene are as follows. Get a good handle on your scene and what personal protective equipment, or PPE, you'll need. Do you need a respirator in the event drug or harmful compounds could be present? Is a drug lab remediation team going to be necessary, perhaps? Work with other first response EMT members to ensure that they can navigate around evidence as best as possible, knowing that this might be a challenge. A good example might be trying to point out key evidence to avoid to EMTs, such as maybe warning them about a potential body fluid stain when moving to care for a victim. And once safety is guaranteed and emergency care is established, you need to figure out the scene borders and lock them down to prevent evidence from being destroyed. Key elements to consider include determining if there's a primary or secondary or additional sites that might exist where potential criminal activity occurred. Are there potential points and paths of exit and entry of the scenes alongside paths where the suspect or victim or witnesses might have fled that could have other evidence that you need to collect? You need to think about that. Another question to ask yourself, are there places where the victim or evidence might have been moved so as to be aware of, for example, trace or impression evidence while assessing the scene? Because so much of our evidence today is trace-based, such as latent prints or touch DNA, you have to be ever vigilant and avoid overexposing a scene to extraneous personnel or carrying over evidence from one area to the next. Obviously, setting up physical barriers is great for larger, broader areas, such as an outside scene, but be wary of using any barriers that could introduce contamination, like extra dirt or DNA, into the scene. I know sometimes you have to get creative with how you establish scene borders. I've seen people use odds and ends from their service vehicles before, for instance. So just know that these items can introduce more components that could easily pose a risk to evidence quality. Another note. Control all individuals at your scene. You need to prevent personnel from altering or destroying physical evidence by restricting movement, location, and activity while ensuring and maintaining safety at your scene. There are three major concerns that you need to be looking at from an evidence quality standpoint. Number one, somebody purposefully or incidentally destroying sensitive evidence at the scene. An example could be someone laying their phone down on a surface with, say, prints or body fluids. Secondly, too many people introducing their DNA into the scene and mucking up samples. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but that's a major concern. And then third, people carrying over evidence between rooms and across items could create major issues with scene reconstruction or lab interpretation. Also, when it comes to documentation, establish good note-taking. Key evidence could arise from your initial observations of the crime scene. 
Some major elements to consider recording would be observations of the crime scene, including the location of persons and items within the scene and the appearance or condition of the scene upon arrival. Personal information from witnesses, victims, suspects, and any statements or comments made are important. As an example, a sandwich left in the garbage with bite marks could otherwise be ignored by investigators if you fail to document it. But what if that sandwich is something the suspect allegedly was eating after they sexually assaulted a child, and the child immediately disclosed it? Now that sandwich and the DNA thereof could corroborate their story and uphold their testimony in court. As an additional point to this tip, I would ask that you be very descriptive while also being objective in your writing. As an example, you could write that there are stains present in the child's bedroom. Or you could be descriptive and say there are yellow crusted stains on the bedspread located on the child's bed. It's accurate, it's informative, and it helps investigators in the MDT hone in on items of pertinence. Now a command post or a centralized location for securing evidence, that's something that's also necessary when we're talking about scene processing tips. It doesn't have to be fancy. You could use your patrol vehicle, for instance, but you need a place to consistently update folks, access equipment for processing different item types, and for securing evidence entered into your growing chain of custody. While I know that many folks may perform a preliminary walkthrough to identify evidence, these are not always necessary, especially if evidence could be contaminated or damaged. As such, just use caution and weigh the risks to evidence being destroyed versus the potential benefits of a walkthrough. To that end, please also remember that a walkthrough is conducted by those processing the scene the investigators, and not first responders. While I understand how some folks may try to be helpful, their lack of understanding of the scene and evidence types could ultimately hurt the overall integrity of the items that are left behind. To help with reconstructive efforts, you're going to naturally need to either sketch the scene or use some kind of modern 3D scanning tool to create a visual representation of the scene. Likewise, photographs should be taken of the crime scene and evidence. Moving on to advanced tips then you need to assess the need for additional personnel. Be aware of the need for extra help in cases involving, for instance, multiple scenes, several victims, or numerous witnesses or unique circumstances. Likewise, evaluate forensic needs and call forensic specialists to the scene for expertise and or equipment, such as maybe the need for a spatter analyst, perhaps. Select qualified persons to perform specialized tasks. Document these team members and their assignments. And be mindful of the fact that in some rural areas, it could take a while for those specialized team members to get on site. So do have contingencies for collection, such as making sure you can ensure long-term scene security. Now this is all determined by scene complexity and evidence demands. When you start to process evidence, do prioritize the collection of fragile items first. What would I consider fragile? You know, I would gauge touch DNA as highly susceptible to destruction, as well as items easily exposed to the elements, or that could get underfoot or blown away even by passing by the item rapidly. Small items like scraps of paper to little specks that might be dilute stains are things that, that I would go for and process first. As with evidence, what methods you use must be prioritized, starting with the least invasive to the most invasive methods. As an example, I'd start with touch swabs and prints since they're the least invasive techniques, and then work my way up to collecting large things like cuttings or bigger items like clothing or bed linens. Or picking them up could possibly aerosolize DNA and cause carryover concerns. Bystanders, those in our own organization or otherwise, don't need to be in a crime scene potentially damaging evidence. If you can't keep them out with traditional barriers, consider logging their information in a scene log in case we wind up getting mixtures of DNA that can't be explained. Or I would recommend just save yourself the trip of tracking them down and make them on scene submit buckle swabs, swabs for DNA, right, from the, the cells inside of your mouth. You'd be surprised how many of our own professionals don't want to submit their DNA if it means they may have to testify as to why they were there at a crime scene when they definitely shouldn't be. Let's revisit documentation from an advanced tip standpoint. A simple tip that folks often don't appreciate. A single line through any information you wrote in error with your initials is a good way to correct your mistakes. If you obliterate a word or phrase in your documents, a savvy defense attorney might actually say that you're trying to cover something up. This also goes for sketches in your chain of custody and so on. Also, when it comes to digital images, do not delete any images that you think are unsatisfactory. You need to keep all files, in sequence. Don't alter the file names either. 
Much like a scratch out in your written documents, deleting files and only keeping your best quality images, for instance, it'll make you look like you're trying to hide something. Likewise, use work computers and work devices for taking photos and recording details. I would hate for your personal phone, for example, to be subject to defense scrutiny because that's where you happen to take your crime scene photos. Don't forget that sketches of scenes are great, but you can also sketch items too. For example, you could sketch a garment and then identify the stains on the items to give us context at the lab and in court. With respect to writing up notes on the scene, and this is a big one, don't document a red stain as blood, since you actually haven't forensically tested it. It could be used against you in court. I actually know of a former colleague who, in court, testified that a presumptive test definitively told the individual that a substance was marijuana. Believe it or not, that's still illegal in Indiana. It did not turn out well for this officer on the stand. Other tips, never reuse tools like forceps between items without sterilizing. Some agencies use disposable single-use items, but the clutter and trash from doing that might be a real challenge to manage at the crime scene. Many investigators, as such, collect items and then sterilize their tools with alcohol and bleach, or they flame sterilize them if they're metal so that they can be reused. On a related note, then, keep your trash in an area separate from the scene in the command center when you're storing evidence to Again, to PPE, your personal protective equipment. Typically, you'll want to use coveralls, a mask, eye protection, uh, booties or foot coverings, and gloves to then keep your DNA out of the scene and likewise to keep the scene and its evidence from infecting or impacting you. Some tips for improving your PPE usage then. Gloves need to be swapped between items. Your foot coverings ideally between rooms to avoid carryover. Don't touch your PPE with clean glove, without clean gloved hands. Don't remove PPE in a scene unless it is an absolute emergency. Don't access personal items using PPE, such as trying to get your phone in text while you're covered in your PPE. You're going to have to change it after that. If your PPE is dirty or if you think it's even compromised, dispose and replace those items. Let's talk a little bit about damp evidence. Moist or wet evidence, such as you know, plant material, living plant matter, or blood, for instance, from a crime scene, can be collected in containers at the scene and transported back to an evidence receiving area if the storage time is two hours or less. And this is done only to prevent contamination of other evidence. If you can, evidence should be dried on scene in a secure area before being packaged and taken to the lab. We'll talk a little bit more about this evidence type, for example, body fluids and plant material, and how to best process them in greater detail in just a little bit. If your team can afford it, consider validating and implementing new equipment that's out there that can really be a game changer. In other lecture series that I provide, for example, I talk about how alternative light sources, or ALS, in other words, light at different wavelengths, can actually help detect near invisible stains, or how you can use even, for instance, a DNA vacuum to process hard to swab or scrape items for DNA, such as a stuffed animal. Never touch your face, your eyes, your nose, or your other mucous membranes, as doing so could then lead to you transferring your DNA to an item if you touch it next or your skin cells could slough off onto an item and contaminate it as well. Likewise, avoid sneezes and coughs as they could spread your DNA. Your health matters too. You don't want to transfer infectious materials back to your body by touching your mucous membranes or other sensitive parts of your body. Now, if you're not sure if an item will be feasible for processing, you can always contact the lab. Where I was employed, investigators and CSIs called the lab regularly on scene and asked about the context of an item and if we could or should process it. As an example, I have dealt with personally in a case where a suspect urinated all over the scene. The DNA from the urine spread across the scene would likely be low in amount and the salts from the urine would make it hard to process. Many labs, for instance, avoid urine and feces due to issues with salts and bacteria making problems for DNA results. Likewise, we've had cases where people want to swab handles to doors from restaurants or heavily trafficked places. We don't process those because the potential for too many mixed DNA samples would make it nearly impossible to give you any meaningful answer. Let's wrap up our advanced tips then. Due to time and budget constraints, labs across the United States have enacted rather tough and perhaps, in investigators' opinions, limiting policies on what items might be submitted and how many items can be submitted per case. As such, to reduce backlog and ensure timely turnaround of evidence results, most labs have tiered evidence policies based on the crime. For example, some crime labs have Tier 1 submissions where you can submit items without ever talking to lab staff, and Tier 2 submissions where you must consult with the lab manager and laboratory analyst before items will be accepted. 
In terms of Tier 1 items, it differs from case to case. Your lab should outline what items meet Tier 1 criteria. For instance, in a literature review, in Illinois, Tier 1 items for a sexual assault case would include a sexual assault kit, DNA standards, and one probative non-kit item. If you lack a sexual assault kit, then any three items can be submitted. Now, the number of exhibits then likewise differs from lab to lab. As I mentioned from my literature review in Illinois, it's three items for a sexual assault. For homicides, they take an average of five items under Tier 1. Wisconsin, on the other hand, takes approximately 10 items for homicides. For sexual assaults, we'll accept a kit, one pair of underwear, and one condom. As such, I'm not suggesting that you abandon potentially incriminating evidence at a scene, but I do want you to consider what evidence is very important versus perhaps less important to your case and to prioritize accordingly when submitting to the lab. To close on this idea, recognize that you cannot collect every item and think the lab will process it. It's just not feasible. Please also think outside of the box about what tests can be ran on an item. Could you do prints and DNA? If so, that may be a more pertinent item to send to the lab than an item where only one type of analysis can be provided. Before you collect and after you submit items to the lab, consider the context of an item and whether forensic results could possibly muddle your case or not. For example, what if you have a case where a stepfather is allegedly a perpetrator and you processed an item for body fluid, say semen, because the claim is a child was sexually assaulted in those clothes. The clothes come back semen negative, so you then demand touch DNA be pulled on the sample. Is it really probative to you? And what if the stepfather does the laundry? What if they don't but lie and say that they do? The defense could easily wave away your item's credibility and the results thereof. It's possible they may have not ejaculated, for instance, as well. But you really need to flesh that out beyond the DNA alone from, say, a forensic interview of the child to reestablish the touch DNA as something meaningful. The same idea at the crime scene. Swabbing a doorknob that the suspect and the victim both touch, such as, say, a bathroom door, doesn't tell us anything more than both people touch the doorknob at some point. Barring there's some more context that would make it a necessary item to process. A bathroom is a common area, for instance, used by many people, making it easily combated by the defense. I would instead focus on other items that corroborate the case in a stronger fashion. In short, look at the totality of your evidence in the context of the items collectively. You can't finish a jigsaw puzzle if the pieces are missing, and that same principle applies here. DNA alone, while a compelling item, may not be the single smoking gun artifact that you need. All right, so let's go ahead and try a little bit of our learning on for size. Go ahead and open up the link provided to you in another tab or window. To use the mock crime scene here, you can click and hold the left button on your mouse and you can scroll around the room. Click on the points of interest that are present and then determine what you might collect in order of prioritization from a contamination or destruction standpoint. Note that the mock house is a crime scene provided to us by Northwest Arkansas Community College and their CAS program in conjunction with the Melba Shoemaker National Child Protection Training Center that's on campus. Images are produced by Shining Star Interactive LLC. So let's go ahead and look at the items. Looks like we have a red stain. Looks like a yellow stain deposited on the bed sheets. Looks like we have potentially a knife with some kind of red stain as well. And then we have what appears to be a condom wrapper. So let's go ahead and go back to our slides then. In terms of what you would collect first, right? In terms of my personal experience, you know, I'd go ahead and I'd start with the red spot on the floor first. The assumption being that it might be blood, right? It's right in the middle of the floor. It's small and it's easily destroyed. So let's get that first. I'm going to go to the condom wrapper next. It's got touch DNA potential, which could be very dilute. So I want to get it quickly before I forget the item simply, or before me moving around the scene could allow DNA to be aerosolized and spread to the item. The knife goes next because I think, you know, there appears to be what could be blood on there. We've got a red stain. Plus the touch DNA on the handle is also potentially there. So I'd go with that third. Now, seminal material is pretty potent in terms of DNA yield. A 5 microliter or small sample, liquid sample of semen has the same DNA roughly as 50 microliters or a dime size stain of blood because it's on a large sheet and you're going to pull that off the bed and potentially then as a result, stir up the air and toss DNA from skin cells on that bed sheet into the air. I think that it needs to go last so it doesn't contaminate then other items.
So we've done a pretty good job covering then the major processing tips from a broad overview. We've done so then with a the keen eye towards avoiding contamination. As a result, I want to take time and really dig into what contaminants exist and what they can do to your evidence before we start digging into major evidence collection methods that, alongside a solid crime scene processing plan, will optimize your evidence robustness. So just looking at this crime scene, you know, some contaminants that I see that might pose a risk, dirt, sunlight, and the ultraviolet rays from it. Plant material like the grass and leaves are a concern. I'd also worry about DNA contamination from the investigator not wearing proper PPE. I've also never seen socks so white on a deceased person in an outdoor crime scene. So I'm immediately, in my mind, thinking that this individual's shoes could be stolen. And if so, we've got a possible mixture situation from that event. Or perhaps from the possibility that maybe the body might have been moved here before or after the head injury. After all, who knows how many people could have helped the body to arrive at this location. Just some thoughts then. Moving on and talking about then contamination, let's focus on perhaps the most concerning form, which is DNA itself. Take any documents from your desk, and go ahead and look at them. Look at the period at the end of a given sentence, for instance. That period has thousands of times more DNA than we need with our currently hypersensitive DNA methods in forensic labs. Two major forms of DNA contamination to worry about then are personnel and carryover contamination. When I'm talking about personnel contamination, I'm talking about when one of us or our colleagues goes into a scene and gets their DNA all over the evidence. There are lots of ways a person can contaminate the evidence. Some of it is just unavoidable. For example, eating and drinking near a scene, not wearing PPE to mitigate DNA sluffage, or non-essential personnel walking around and looking at items, that is something completely avoidable. But essential personnel might be unable to mitigate contamination if they're giving life-saving measures, or if you're in an area where there's uncontrollable poor ventilation. That can allow DNA to carry in the air from us talking or walking around as it then drifts and spreads. Carryover DNA contamination occurs when we transfer DNA from one item of evidence to the next. It occurs when we don't sterilize tools between uses, or we don't replace dirty or contaminated PPE, or there's some kind of aerosol event that results in DNA bloom. Because we've gotten so sensitive in detecting DNA with modern genetic chemistries, we now have entered an era with touch DNA where we can pick up DNA from multiple people at once. Typically, forensic samples with one to two people can be deconvoluted, or in other words, we can separate out who's who in the sample. Beyond around four people and up, we share too much DNA and simply can't sort out who's who in the samples. Thus, you need to be extra vigilant and avoid carryover and personnel contamination so as to mitigate mixture potential and remove the threat of your agency then being labeled as unprofessional because you can't keep your own DNA profiles off of your samples. It's something that should be easily avoidable. Unfortunately, I've seen in recently in the news that some law enforcement agency out there has actually had contaminating events every single month for this year. So please make every effort to minimize this outcome for your evidence. Go ahead and cover other possible adulterants that could ruin your evidence. Let's start with bile salts. Those are excreted in feces and will mess with your DNA analysis. Specifically, the salts interfere with our forensic DNA kit's copying machine, known as a polymerase. And we can't make enough DNA then potentially to get you a profile for match purposes. You know, sugars from plants and food material or feces mixed in your samples will bog them down. Collagen found in human tissues from a grizzly scene can bind DNA and make it difficult to copy. Heme actually gunks up the DNA copy machine too. It's a part of hemoglobin in our blood. And likewise, antibodies in our tissues can challenge forensic chemistries. Now, I'm presenting this information to you so that you can understand that a great evidentiary sample in and of itself, like blood, is inherently challenged to us at the laboratory so that you can appreciate how what you feel is an easy DNA sample for us is actually something relatively complex to process in reality. Moving on, humic acids from soil or plant material can bind to DNA and prevent it from being copied. It can also bind to other chemicals or enzymes in the DNA kit and prevent DNA from being copied or at least lead to less DNA being made to generate a profile. Urea and urine, for instance, will chew up the DNA copy machine in our kits. And lastly, tannins, otherwise known as tannic acid, which is present in tree bark, leather hides, or even wine, can attach to the DNA copy machine and inhibit it. Other concerns, indigo dye from denim in our genes, believe it or not, is an issue. That bluish dye in genes can prevent DNA from being accessible to copy. And if it makes it all the way, in other words, it's co-purified with DNA, all the way to profile development, 
it basically can blind the camera in our capillary electrophoresis machine and throw off the profile generation process. In short, the camera may only see the blue color and it cannot detect the other color tagged pieces of DNA used to create our robust DNA profile. Now, bacteria on items can be bad for a few reasons. First, the bacteria can consume cells and thereby destroy the DNA inside of them. Bacteria also have enzymes that can destroy the components of our DNA kits. Lastly, if the bacterial DNA gets co-purified with human DNA, it can actually mask the human DNA and prevent it from being amplified for a profile. Milk and dairy products wreak havoc on samples as well, as calcium stops the DNA copy machine from working, and enzymes in the milk can chew up the DNA kit components. Something as simple as laundry detergent, if purified with a DNA sample, can destroy the kit components or bind up DNA so it can't be copied. Now, while not true contaminants, heat and ultraviolet light are categorized as such because they can totally destroy your DNA samples. And finally, water or other solutions can dilute a sample, leaving us with too little DNA to process on top of other additives that may be included that could muck up the DNA processing methods that we use. I want to recognize that sometimes crimes occur where you just can't avoid contaminants that I just listed. Sometimes they happen in grimy environments, and as you saw, some body fluids themselves are inherently filled with contaminants that our own body generates. When you can, however, follow these guidelines to improve potential use of your evidence in spite of it being sullied. You know, let the lab know, first and foremost, if you think something is contaminated. We can take extra precautions and use different methods to help pull the contaminants away from a sample and give it our absolute best effort to gather robust DNA for a possible profile. Before you start collecting evidence, recognize potential contaminants so that you can avoid them in the first place. Prioritize evidence, again, based on the chances of it being contaminated. For example, I'd collect items outside before going inside because of sunlight and personnel interactions that could contaminate items. Inform others, empower others in your MDT of any possible contaminants in the event they might have to help with evidence collection or potentially create then a contaminating scenario. If you follow best practices on evidence handling, you're also going to in turn minimize the potential for evidence contamination. So let's go ahead and explore best practices on common evidentiary items. So my background is in biology, but I was also trained on other evidence collection types and general forensic practices during my lab tenure. As such, I can outline best practices for major evidence you may encounter for child maltreatment related casework. Just note that this is a greatest hits list, if you will, given the limited time we have today. It shouldn't be considered as a definitive, fully exhaustive list since each case may have unique evidentiary items to it. I'm also going to cover the collection of different items with the caveat that all items should be properly photographed and sketched so as to show relationships within the crime scene. Never forget these pieces of the puzzle in reconstruction, especially with some labs having a turnaround time of six months or longer. Please also note for the sake of time that I'm only going to cover the major and pertinent points on each slide. As such, there's more information both in the slides and in the references and resources that I provide with each slide that you have access to today that can be used for learning more about each specific evidence type and the collection thereof outside of this presentation. All right, let's start with body fluids. As you can see from the list, the evidence sources here can be practically limitless with basically anything where a body fluid uh, being let, flung or otherwise deposited being of pertinence. If we're talking about what a stain may look like specifically, I can tell you the detection varies depending on the type of fabric or material in which a stain might be deposited. But these are just some of the key features of what each stain looks like typically. As I mentioned earlier, ALS, that alternative light source, can be used at different wavelengths to detect blood, semen, or saliva if you think it's present. Again, ALS is not a test itself, it's just a screening tool. Lots of things, for instance, fluoresce like semen, such as laundry detergent. Let's talk about collection then. As it pertains to a dry stain, you'll have to moisten it to pull it up onto a swab. So distilled water is typically recommended when the stain is wholly dry. You put the water onto the swab and then you'll pull it up onto that swab material. But I'd go a step further and buy nuclease-free water. It is expensive, but there's no DNA in the water. And yes, we've actually had issues where so-called sterile water has had either bacteria or DNA in it. In terms of a swabbing technique, simply roll the moistened swab through the stain and collect it in its entirety. If you think the smaller droplets near larger ones are connected to the same stain pattern, in short, it's all one spatter pattern, you can collect it all in one swab. Otherwise, you need to use a powerful tool your discretion to determine if you need one swab per stain or not. Make sure the swab doesn't touch any other surface. Swabs should be dried in a drying box or placed in your command center away from other people and outside of direct sunlight. 
Do not use dryers to dry the swab as that heat could destroy or damage the DNA. Swab should be sealed in paper bindles and swab boxes. You can snap the handle off of the swab, but do let your analysts know so they don't poke themselves. If several swabs come from the same source or stain, you can usually bundle them together versus packaging them individually. All body fluid items need to be in breathable paper containers so they don't mold or allow bacteria to grow over and contaminate the stain and putrefy the item. For larger and movable items or things that just can't be reasonably transported to the lab, like big patches of carpet or large furniture items, do consider scraping or cutting the stain as appropriate. We also want the non-stain control scrapings or cuttings, respectively, to make sure that there's nothing inherently present on the surface of these items that could cause concern with our test methods. Dry the items and store in paper, not plastic. You know, things like underwear, shirts, or stuffed animals and such, if the item is dry, should be wrapped in clean butcher paper or the like to preserve any trace evidence on the item and ensure the stain doesn't transfer or shed to the outside of the papered container in which it's stored. If possible, avoid crumpling and wadding, which could allow the stain to pass DNA to other areas of the item. Wet items should be placed in the command area away from other personnel and allowed to dry before you package it if possible. Dry by placing it on or over a clean piece of paper, or dry in place in the scene if it's more secure. If not, I would adhere to the two-hour rule that I gave you earlier and let the lab air dry the item in their drying room or with their drying cabinets. Now, I would also submit any drying paper that the stain soaked into for possible processing, too. Don't forget that you can, again, create a quick sketch to help identify where stains are before you package items. Typically, each item gets its own packaging, but there are exceptions. For instance, if you've got several cigarette butts in a container or cluster and only one known smoker, then the context of the case could indicate that you might be able to bundle them. Again, use your discretion to determine how to best package that item with biological evidence. When possible, in the case of DNA, always collect standards from victims or suspects. They can be used, for example, in your case to eliminate non-criminal persons the victims, for instance, from a mixed DNA sample, and likewise help us hone in on the criminal contributor of a stain. With respect to sexual assault kit collection, I think some agencies get confused on who should collect this evidence. A professional trained on medical forensic examination should be the one doing the exam and collecting the evidence, not untrained nurses or doctors or investigators. Sexual assault nurse examiners, for instance, are specifically trained on sexual assault kit collection. I'd also recommend you really work through what it means to be trauma-informed as an investigative unit with your MDT when it comes to kit collection. I have heard some stories of law enforcement staying in the room during collection when they have no business doing so, or doctors and nurses trying to force victims by holding them down to submit samples. I've also seen issues where our MDT do not provide victim requests for improved services when they can. For example, they want the victim does, a female nurse to help process their samples. And you have a female sane nurse on staff, but you don't accommodate the victim. That's not very trauma informed. I've also heard of issues where advocates get too close during processing and can contaminate items. There are all kinds of these stories. So be trauma informed, consider what it means to be trauma informed as an MDT. Let's go ahead and chat about collection then of these kit items. You know, general rule of thumb is two or few swabs per area. Any more than that, and you're probably diluting beyond what we can pull uh, DNA from that body area. You know, as with a regular crime scene, don't talk over the person's body, wear PPE and change it between sample collection areas because we don't want to risk contamination. Use a patient's history and what allegedly transpired to collect samples. You don't need to hold somebody down. You don't need to force them to submit an anal swab if no details inform you to collect that item. Remember that a sexual assault kit is a toolkit of sorts. You may not need all the items in that kit depending on the nature of the case, so don't use everything if it's not necessary. Timelines are fluid in sexual assault evidence collection. Typically, the case circumstances can be helpful in determining whether an attempt to collect evidence would be fruitful or not. In the case, you know, if the case has an unknown or variable type of assault, such as the assailant ejaculating on the person, your best bet is to use your judgment and the guidelines from the table provided here. Generally speaking, the 72-hour rule is a good rule of thumb to apply in these cases. Now, there are several other factors to consider with evidence collection for sexual assault kits that could impact the quality of your evidence, or if you'll even get DNA from an item. You know, the longer you go, the less chance for evidence as countless factors could lead to its destruction or contamination or dilution. Looking at temperature, if it's hot out and the person sweats, it could destroy or dilute the samples faster. 
Conversely, bodies trapped in cold conditions could harbor samples longer. Any activity that results in rubbing off of evidence or smearing it elsewhere is a concern. Physical exertion, too, could rub the evidence off or dilute it with sweat. Bathing is a concern, too, but it doesn't mean it's impossible to get samples off of an item or a person if they've been in water, if the item's been submerged. I've heard from colleagues where, in one case, a child swam in a nearby pond after a sexual assault, and days later, they still got similar material collected from behind the child's ear. There are also studies showing that touch DNA and stains can be retrieved from items left underwater. So nothing is impossible, even if your victim or items have been cleansed. Consider the potential that a condom was used and may be collecting that item for processing. Note that you may not get seminal evidence if the perpetrator pulled out pre-ejaculation. Don't dismiss the idea that something else besides explicit sexual contact involving ejaculation occurred. In short, don't let your bias force you to look with tunnel vision when other evidence might tell you something else is going on in the case. Medical conditions could also impact whether evidence is present. For example, you've got oligospermia, where the perpetrator might have a low sperm count. You could have aspermia, where they have no sperm produced. As a result, you might get a presumptive test that tells you that semen is present, but you may not get a confirmatory test to show sperm as such. Likewise, there's also medically induced conditions, such as vasectomy, where we actually cut the sperm off from dissemination into the semen. The following is just a major showcase of items that are present in a kit today. You know, swabs are evident per our mention earlier. They should be wetted for dry surfaces, such as skin with dry stains. Tissues that are inherently damp, such as the oral cavity, could be swabbed dry. Now, I know this might be something new to some of you, but we do swab the underside of fingernails with a lightly moistened swab. Unless the victim's history, such as scratching, uh, indicates that nail clippings would yield additional DNA. This is just a less traumatic way to yield the same information. The swab can, can pull enough DNA from the underside of those fingernails if needed. You know, in terms of hair, matted hair may be clipped or swabbed with lightly, lightly moistened swabs. If you are combing, please do so over butcher paper to collect the trace evidence. Clothing should be packaged separately from the kit and labeled with each item in its own paper bag. Underwear might fit into a kit, but it can be packaged separately as needed. You can wrap it in paper to avoid contamination of stains as well. I'd recommend having the person remove their clothing over butcher paper and then collect it too in case some trace evidence sloughs off during disrobing. Also, as an MDT, again, being trauma-informed, make sure then that the victim has an extra pair of clothes ready for them. Some agencies even have clothing donations for victims so that they can get new clothes and they don't have to worry about someone going and getting them for them. So do consider that practice. You know, additional considerations and other things you could think about collecting are, for instance, placental or fetal tissue that remains in the uterus after, for instance, a spontaneous pregnancy loss, a miscarriage, planned pregnancy termination, or preterm or term delivery. Now, again, this is an atypical sample, so make sure that you develop best practice policies uh, with your agency if you should be collecting this type of evidence. Tampons and condoms are foreign objects that might be a potential source of DNA should be preserved and packaged as necessary. Other objects to consider might be pull-ups or diapers or other absorbent components a child wore during an assault or soon after where drainage might have occurred. I also want to cover other samples that, while they can be collected, do not make up a consistent part of the sexual assault kit collection process. For example, we don't typically collect emesis or vomit. There is no research supporting the practice to date of its collection or analysis after an oral sexual assault. In fact, the stomach acid and the bacteria thereof will likely negate any human DNA recovery. With respect to flossing, our techniques are so sensitive nowadays that swabbing the oral cavity should be suffice. We have to be sensitive to the fact that flossing could damage the mouth and result in infection in our victim. So it's largely not recommended anymore as a post-assault collection method. Research doesn't support the nasal cavity and a swab thereof as a consistent sample to collect. Now, your case history might dictate otherwise, but from a sample, from a standard sample standpoint, you know, our noses actually collect so much viral and bacterial pollution that it's really not an optimal area to, to process. In fact, nasal rinses or swabs could cause infection. You also have to consider other applications like having them blow their nose, but naturally in the context of disease spread, especially since currently we're living through a pandemic. With respect to plucking, I have heard where some folks actually enact this process, in particular with male suspect sexual assault kits. I'm going to be honest, I think this is poor form. It's traumatizing and it's painful, and you pulling hairs from somebody, suspect or victim, it's showing bias on the surface. It's showing poor form, especially when we know that combing and swabbings of hair are sufficient. 
Washes likewise are being phased out. You know, I've seen these in my lab career, but swabs are typically more informative than washes. Washes pose an infection risk to the victim. So again, use this at your own discretion. Storage of items is obviously an important element to maintain our evidence integrity. Now the following table, you can read this here, just list temperature conditions for different items with a check mark indicating the best or acceptable temperature storage at which these items can be held. Now this is short-term storage. The same thing applies for long-term storage than here. Again, check mark is the ideal uh, method for long-term storage. Now, in the past year or so, there's been great controversy on so-called Me Too kits that allow victims of sexual assault to either self-collect or to have others collect it from them. Prosecutors are sending out notices not to process these kits, and attorney generals are sending out cease and desist letters to production companies stating that these kits violate state laws on consumer protection and so on. The reality, too, is that the last kit I observed was very limited, like the one in the image shown. There's only a handful of swabs, and most are centered only on vaginal and anal assault. I also can't fathom asking a parent to swab their child or asking a friend to sit and observe and collect and then sign off on that observation of collection to act as a witness in court. Nor can I imagine storing this kid at your house until it's time to submit for processing. It's just a trauma-filled circumstance. You're not properly trained either, making the chances for contamination most certainly real. Further, I'm worried that folks don't know enough about Jane and John Doe kit policies that do exist by state, nor do I think that they recognize the need for more than evidence collection to help them post assault, that a victim might need medical treatment and evaluation, or psychological resources and outreach, or even an advocate, things these kits don't provide knowledge or access to at the moment. Now, there are merits to these types of kits, however, that we can't ignore. For instance, we know that 77% of those who've been victims of completed rape, attempted rape, and 75% of sexual assaults are unreported to law enforcement. In theory, a well-designed kit of this nature, then, it could help us reach out and empower those who are afraid to access the traditional pathways. Lisa Smith and her colleagues at the University of Leicester in the UK have been examining these kits and their utility in impoverished and crime-torn countries like Kenya, where 14% of women in Kenya have experienced sexual violence in their lives, and less than 10% of the rape cases are reported to police. They studied their own version of this kit, known as an evidence kit, and they found that DNA profiles are just as robust as those collected forensically through a medical exam. All this to say, I think the Me Too kits, they're not going to go away. I think we need to stop siloing and resisting the idea that a victim may advocate for themselves, and we need to instead start working with these companies. Working with them doesn't mean that the kits may make it to market, but maybe they start making better kits for our labs, or maybe... They start advocating for the system and they help us fix it and make it better so that we don't need self-collection kits. I think there's some great potential for collaboration to improve victim and investigative potential. And we need to explore that versus putting up a barrier to those who are, we are trying to help in earnest. Again, major trace evidence types are here as we continue on through our discussion on evidence typologies. You know, looking at trace considerations, lifting with forceps, just a fancy word for tweezers, is pretty cut and dry. Just be mindful of the container you're storing in it. Check edges of the container and make sure that the evidence can't fall out. You decide if hair fibers should be bundled together or separately based on, again, your discretion in the case and patterns observed for this evidence. Again, forceps are recommended as the, the primary method for collection, with tape being a secondary measure. Moving on then, I'm not sure how up to speed this audience might be on fingerprints, but latent prints need developed because they are not easily observable. Well, patent prints are those that are readily visible. A few considerations then. Don't dip your brush into the original powder source container. Instead, you need an aliquot from that container. Because what could happen is you could potentially introduce DNA into the powder through a crossover uh, or carryover contaminating event, and then you contaminate your samples downstream. That entire container of developing powder could then be compromised. Other thoughts I have on the subject include tapping excess powder off the brush before you develop a print. Do not blow excess powder off the print using your breath because you'll end up getting DNA all over an item. Most labs will want, in addition to lifted prints, photos with and without scale submitted with those items. If you're not developing the prints yourself, such as if you want the lab to develop latent prints, or you have a patent print to send off for review, it has been recommended that you fume non-porous items with super glue when possible prior to submission to the lab. What this does is it helps stabilize or lock in the print to help improve its development then finally at the lab. Naturally limit handling of the items 
and the surfaces that you're going to print. The more you handle the item, the more you could destroy unseen latent prints. Think critically. Try to handle the item or items on surfaces where you're not likely to get a print or where there's a less chance for development, you know, such as a ridged or textured surface as opposed to a smooth surface. With respect to storage and transit, do not use clear backers or plastic to store prints alone. Instead, sealing these items in a bag, a paper bag, cardboard box, or an envelope are agreeable ways of securing those items. You know, some labs are actually allowing you to submit photographic evidence of prints electronically nowadays. Some of the merits include the fact that you have less people handling the items and fewer transfers that could confound your chain of custody, and then less issues with packaging. You don't have to turn in a digital disk or images on a separate USB or card uh, for the lab to examine those images. Agency trips to the lab are minimized then, saving you money and time and allowing officers to stay in the community, working cases, and typically turn around is faster with this streamlined process. The state police lab in Indiana, for example, surmises that around 60% of latent print cases could be submitted electronically. So it's worth a look. Again, we're going to talk about controlled substances very briefly. We're going to be talking specifically on pharmaceuticals and illicit tablets then on this slide. You know, mixtures of pharmaceutical tablets and or capsules with different markings and or colors, they need to be separated physically, counted, and individually described. Mixtures of illicit tablets and capsules with different markings and or different colors do not need to be separated if they're all found together. The lab will sort them out since you have no way of knowing what is in these items. In short, they could all look different, but be the same compound. When we're talking about collection and storing, then clear plastic bags are the way to go for sealing these items. Now, this helps ensure the evidence description is correct and allows the items to be viewed in court without opening. Basically, everything but plant matter gets put into plastic. You should then seal the plastic bag inside another container like a box or envelope. The rationale is simple and it's safety oriented. With fentanyl and carfentanyl being a risk to analysts, we need the items duly packaged securely so that if a transport vessel gets damaged, an analyst won't accidentally be exposed and possibly overdose. Let's go ahead and talk about plant matter then. Clearly, marijuana may differ from state to state, but there's other plant material that people can abuse too. Peyote or poppies or salvia are just a few examples. Plastic bags are not recommended for fresh plant materials as they encourage the formation of mold, or in many cases can cause decomposition, prevent identification, and then present safety and health hazards to our lab analysts. Labs will typically analyze vegetative material, but only the leaves, seeds, stems, those don't get processed. Labs are not gonna also have you bring in the whole live plant. So instead you'll have to strip the stalks and package the leaves or other components used from the plant. Furthermore, if you have large amounts of plant-based material, you'll have to take random samples from the large source. A laboratory does not want a 50 pound bale of marijuana, for instance, to process. Let's go ahead and talk about then the drug use items themselves, paraphernalia. Many labs do not accept mirrors or razors, blades, syringes, and the like. Rinses of these items are accepted instead. Rinses using alcohol like isopropanol or methanol are agreeable, but water is not. Now the reason is pretty simple. Alcohols are better solvents of organic molecules. And so what happens is you end up getting more of your evidence collected through an alcohol rinse than water in this way. In terms of collecting and packaging, you know, a glass test tube is just alone in an envelope with no padding or way to secure it. It's asking to be crushed in transit and then the contents could pose a health risk to any of the analysts or those that are shipping the item if they get cut or exposed to those chemicals. So package it in such a way that it won't get broken. Believe it or not, I've seen in my time in the lab Tubes that have been sent with nothing but just an envelope between them and the person handling it. It's just a dangerous practice. Other thoughts on paraphernalia. Drug lab analysts typically won't go for items that are mixed with body fluids. So be mindful of this. Vape pens and the like also, because they can explode, are typically not taken. Instead, the labs will only take the cartridges and not the pen itself. So just to conclude on our packaging segment, biological items including plant matter, that goes in paper, while other drug items typically go into plastic containers. One element of packaging evidence that often gets ignored is how to seal a container. The acceptable means by which we can seal those packages are displayed here. Just make sure to always seal across all openings. And additionally, make sure your tape covers all openings and you don't leave those sticky hanging edges. You can fold the tape on the edges over on itself and then clip the hanging edges away from your package. 
Let's also give a moment to consider how we label items in their packaging too. Typically, these are the things listed here recorded on an evidence bag or container. Along with the bare minimum being the initials of the collector, the date and time, the case number, the ID number, and the evidence number. In terms of initially, with paper bags, initial the top and bottom edges of the tape so that it crosses the seal. For plastic heat seals, initial over the heat seal front and back. Initial across any folds and flaps too on envelopes and boxes. Initials over seals in this fashion are useful to help mitigate the potential opening of items if not warranted in accordance with our chain of custody. In other words, if I see that your seal and the initials are broken before I go to opening an item at the lab, we're going to have to have a conversation about that issue and whether we can logically process this item since it would appear that the item has been compromised. Let's talk about then some basic considerations when you get ready to turn your items into lab for processing. You know, did you collect items with evidence tiers in mind? You really have to think about that and what's important. Inspect all of your items. Are they packaged properly and sealed accordingly with physical evidence bulletins or submission policy manual requirements in mind? Are there any issues with your chain of custody? What about things like typos or spelling? Again, I've seen cases get backlogged because, for instance, an investigator misspelled items or names, and we need to then get confirmation in the lab because the discrepancy could be used in court to attack the lab or the investigative agency. Don't wait then also last second to identify what testing you want done. Have a clear idea for what you want from a services standpoint when you walk into the laboratory. When in doubt, consult with lab staff to determine best fit testing services. Many items could be analyzed by several units, such as DNA swab from a baggie containing drugs processed by the drug analysis unit. But we need to know what you want in advance. If you wait too late, we may not be able to pass the item on to another unit. For example, if fingerprints develops something with their powders, the salts, those chemicals in the developing powder could mitigate any chances of DNA on an item. And so we need to know beforehand so that prints and the DNA unit can both work together to make sure we can get both results for you. Now let's talk about that record of your items. Establishing a chain of custody is undoubtedly the most critical process of evidence documentation and the evidence collection process as a whole. Without a clean and well-documented chain of custody, none of your evidence ultimately matters. Why? Because your chain of custody is a running document demonstrating evidence integrity. It shows the court and triers of fact that the evidence is authentic and nearly, pending some use of that item for forensic analysis, the same as the evidence seized at the crime scene. It also shows the evidence was, at all times, in the custody of a person designated to handle it and for which it was never unaccounted. What is a chain of custody then? Typically, a chain of custody is a series of documents that are physical or electronic that show the continuity of possession of evidence or custody thereof and its movement in precise location from the point of discovery to its transport to the laboratory and until the time it is allowed and admitted into court. In other words, it tells you who had contact with the evidence, the date and time the evidence was handled, the circumstances behind the evidence being handled, and what changes, if any, were made in the evidence. And I'm giving you this definition because, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, some law enforcement agencies do not have chain of custody procedures, and how they've not gotten in trouble in court is beyond me, as it is simply a lawsuit waiting to happen for your agency. Chain of custodies are admittedly often time-consuming to maintain, and they can get quite lengthy but they are absolutely necessary. There are a lot of names for a chain of custody too, just in case this wording is confusing for some of you in attendance today. You might hear it called an evidence log, a property report, and so on. So if my lingo is confusing, just know that there's many aliases for a chain of custody. There are common myths to chain of custody documents that I do wanna highlight. You know, there's no limit to the number of transfers on an item, so long as the transfer is logical and necessary. Some agencies may buck this notion and say, you need to keep the number of transfers low. But to me, this is illogical. You transfer the evidence as long as you need to for forensic and investigative review. What you should limit is the number of transfers of people that have no business with that item. Some agencies may think the lab does not care about chain of custody, but that couldn't be any further from the truth. Forensic laboratories need to validate an item's chain of custody because upon obtaining that item, they now resume or assume the liability for the condition of that item, and they need it to help document all authorized testing on an item. 
If we take several grams from a suspected illegal substance or cut a stain from a garment, we need to track that and demonstrate why it was needed in court to combat defense claims of it being tampered with. So yes, forensic laboratories need to be a part of your chain of custody in the long run, and they have heavy investment in maintaining that record. In fact, any agency that is going to host evidence needs to understand basic chain of custody use to ensure that they're not drawn under fire for potentially jeopardizing an item's integrity. I've even seen in my training Defense ask why it took so long for evidence clerks to get items from our vault as an argument for dismissing an item in court. So I know that a, this is a topic the defense counsel will often use at times to attack your items. You know, this paper trail is so important to us in the laboratories, in fact, that accrediting agencies such as the American Society for Testing and Materials, ASTM, they actually have specific standards for chain of custody upkeep in our labs. The last I checked, it was standard ASTM D4840. Likewise, the National Institute of Standards and Technology even partnered with the National Institutes of Justice to create a steering committee to establish best practices for evidence chain of custody because they recognize its ultimate value. There are plenty of issues that can arise with the chain of custody if you're not careful. Items could be collected incorrectly or packaged inappropriately, which could disqualify the evidence being processed. You know, if the lab does the wrong test on the item against the request for lab exam, or if there's an issue with the testing, then it could pose an issue to the evidence being admitted to court. Items could be stored out of appropriate temperature conditions, calling into question the integrity of the samples processed. Information could be missing or recorded in error or omitted from a chain of custody. I've seen spelling errors, as I mentioned earlier, that could cause issues. I've seen lacking testing information or mix up on case numbers and more on sample items. If that's the case, we have to figure it out and establish a corrective action to get the chain of custody back on track if possible. Basically, any deviation of written policy or method can get your evidence tossed by breaking with expectations overall. The biggest threat, perhaps, is large gaps in time where items go missing or transfers to different agencies or people have no valid reason. For instance, I've actually heard stories of evidence getting mixed up in the mail, such as a DWI blood sample being mailed to an attorney unrelated to the case. So how do we increase our knowledge on this subject? For starters, an investigative agency and MDT should provide training on establishing, maintaining, and testifying regarding chain of custody. These trainings should include mock scenarios and activities designed around active knowledge and skill development, and not consist solely of lectures and hands-off learning. In other words, you need to create simulations that engage the person and allow them to test drive the knowledge and get comfortable with the chain of custody basics. Maintain records of this training and make sure that you regularly engage in proficiency testing or training of this type to gauge the evidence handler's skills and knowledge. The other elements of this slide are just minor nuances I've seen missing in chain of custodies that could be of concern. For instance, be consistent with your item numbers and have a policy in place for tethering sub items to parent items. For example, if item one is a swab, DNA extract from it could be item 1A. Each item and sub-item needs a unique identifier, and I've seen where agencies ignore their own policies on this and number things differently between employees or get confused and number things incorrectly. I've also seen gaps in acknowledging the location of an item in property or evidence storage rooms or other external locations, such as court, or crime lab, or other investigative agency. Dates and times and who things are submitted to especially if the item is passed to several different agencies, is a place that is easy to create hiccups in your chain of custody. So please make sure that you review that information anytime you're submitting or taking back an item. Other improvements include, at a minimum, annually if not quarterly, an inventory review to verify the evidence in the property room is present and in its specified location. Given how detailed chain of custodies can get, it's recommended that agencies acquire inventory systems to track item movement, provide succinct record keeping, for example, one digital chain of custody trail, maintain item inventory, and fuel easy access to items. Both of the laboratories I've worked in had a laboratory inventory management system, or a LIM system, and one actually had barcode tags for scanning items in and out with detailed inventory information. Now, I say this with a caveat, you need to work with your experienced evidence custodians and investigators to conduct a needs assessment. Maybe what you're doing currently works, and if it isn't broke, don't fix it. If you do need it, several vendors can be explored, and make sure you're looking at all of the different platforms out there to ensure the integration of technology is smooth and efficient for your 
property handling needs. Now, a quality property management system should include a means to identify overdue items or evidence that has not been returned according to the agency's policy. These policies need to attempt to establish contact with those in possession of evidence through multiple outreach attempts and with multiple contact approaches. You know, start with emails and build up to calls and formal letters. At multiple levels of responsibility, you start directly, for example, maybe with an analyst. And then you go all the way up to maybe the agency director as necessary. It goes without saying, but access to lockers and vaults and so on should be limited so as to avoid issues with safety and tampering. As concerning as written policies may be, they are more helpful than harmful. Standard operating procedures inform, especially new employees, how to proceed and maintain a chain of custody when in doubt. In short, it's better to have them than not. In terms of closing statements, earlier I mentioned that if we don't learn from history, we are bound to repeat it. While all evidence handling and chain of custody components to our jobs may be an additional and, albeit complex, layer to our already burgeoning workload, these skills and knowledge on how to collect items and ensure they represent what truly happened in a case should be viewed as tools in our war on child maltreatment. We don't have to repeat the mistakes of old if we simply equip ourselves with this information and see it as a way to improve our field and ensure that each child has a fighting chance at a better life. At this point, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I'd like to thank William and his associates for helping make this possible. If you'd like to learn more about child advocacy studies or you'd like to learn more about forensic needs and forensic assessment, uh, I am available. You can contact me through our website or through my email here. I am available for training and technical assistance as it pertains to uh, then forensic processing and forensic analysis as it pertains to your child maltreatment cases. At this point, again, thank you all so much, and I will hand it back over to William. All right, great. Thank you very much, Tyler, for that wonderful presentation. Just a few things to note for folks uh, before we wrap up with today's webinar. Uh, please note that we, uh, if you have any questions or if you'd like to contact INTAC in regards to this web event or any other web event, you may do so uh, at the information located on this slide. Uh, please be sure to uh, either select the link or text NTTAC to 22828 to sign up for our listserv to learn more about uh, wonderful presentations like the one you just uh, saw here. Also, don't forget to go on Facebook and be sure to like us at OJJDP TTA. If you'd like to get in contact with OJJDP's help desk, please note that you may do so by uh, contacting us at the uh, information that you see on this slide, including this phone number and this email address. If you'd like to get in contact with OJJDP, you may do so at the website that's displayed on this slide. Uh, be sure to sign up for OJJDP's list service well, and be sure to also check out their upcoming events that they have posted on their site. Do you have a training or technical assistance need? Well, if so, please be sure to submit a request via the OJJDP TTA 360 platform. You may do so at the URL link or URL on this slide. And uh, just a reminder, we do have this webinar, including other past webinars, or archived webinars that we have located on our Intag YouTube channel. Please be sure to reach out to OJJDPTTA at usdoj.gov if you would like to obtain any supporting or related materials to any of our webinars. And be sure to uh, check out these upcoming webinars that we have slated. Uh, we have one coming up on December 9th with our colleagues with the National District Attorneys Association. And then we also have another uh, zero abuse project webinar coming up on December 15th, uh, hosted by the wonderful presenter that you all just heard from. So please be sure to go and register for that webinar as well. And that being said, I would like to thank everyone for coming out. Have a wonderful afternoon and thank you for attending today's web event. Take care. Bye-bye.